Welcome to a video on how to help your pets survive a heat wave. Now, it's way too hot to be recording in my studio while wearing a dress shirt today, so I'm recording in my living room while wearing a t-shirt and a cat. This is young Claudia here, and of course I am Dr. Burstein, and I'm gonna help you help your little animal friends in your life, regardless of what species they may be, uh, survive heat waves and tolerate the hot summer weather a lot better than they otherwise would. Summers are getting hotter and heat waves are gonna become a regular part of our life for the next couple decades until we get this whole global warming thing under control, which I really hope we will. Uh, so, this is a video for everybody who has a pet, but specifically if you have a senior pet with health conditions. So, because I know my audience, I know most of you are probably cat people, so I'm going to put the cats last. I'm going to talk about dogs, reptiles, rabbits, and felines, but cats are going to go last, so you guys have to watch the rest of this video to get to the good stuff. You know, or skip ahead, but really you should watch the rest of the video, it's pretty useful. And of course, even though you might only have a cat in your life now, who knows what's going to happen in the future, right? The more animals, the better, is what I say. And before we get into the video, please remember to squish that subscribe button, pet the bell notification icon, like, share, and of course, come support me on Patreon if you appreciate the good work that I do online and want to buy the guys some cat food. Before we get into specific species, I just want to do some general recommendations, specifically if your pets live outside. Now, it doesn't matter if this is a dog, a turtle, or if you have a cat that roams outside, you want to create an outdoor space for your pets that is shady, and that has water, specifically fresh water, topped up daily preferably, and probably more water than they would need in cooler weather. So you just want to create an environment where your pets can regulate their own body temperature without any help from you or with minimal help. So shade, shelter from the sun, not lots of water, absolutely essential for any animal outside in the hot weather. Same thing for indoor pets, make sure they always have fresh water, ideally changed daily because cats in particular like fresh water. You can have a water dish that's sitting there for three or four days. It might still be full, but it won't be as attractive to your cat as a fresh water dish topped up that morning. Of course, uh, also you do what you can to keep your home cool. Make sure they have access to shady areas. If you have a basement that's colder than the rest of the house, maybe create access to your pets there so they can go down there if they need to chill out. Let's start with dogs. Uh, dogs generally tolerate heat quite well unless they are brachycephalic. Brachycephalic breeds are the ones with a short face. Think like bulldogs, Boston Terriers, French bulldogs, uh, pugs. These are classical brachycephalic breeds. Their entire face is a little squished up because of inbreeding, so they have reduced airways. And one of the things that this means for the dog is that they have reduced ability to shed heat when it gets really hot. I have a whole video on brachiocephalic dog breeds uh, that you guys should definitely check out and it's going to be a link to it in the description of the video. Uh, but for the purposes of understanding how to help these breeds survive hot weather, we have to look at how dogs manage their body heat. Now they don't sweat like humans do, but they still rely on convective cooling just like all mammalian species. Uh, it's just that their convective cooling happens in their mouth and their airways, so they pant. Uh, they also lose heat through their paw pads, so, and arguably they might produce a little bit like sweat-like substance on their little pads of their paws. Mostly they control their heat by convective cooling in their mouth, and also of course they can radiate heat from structures like the ears and parts of their skin that don't have a lot of hair on them. So brachycephalic breeds, for them, the major mechanism, the panting, is broken. The first thing I'm going to tell you if you have a brachycephalic breed in your life is don't take them for walks in the middle of the day. Take them for walks in the morning or late in the evening when things have cooled down a bit. And don't play with them vigorously, especially during the day, but even in the evenings, you know, if it doesn't get that cool in the evening, don't throw the ball for them, don't make them run. Dogs have no common sense. And what you want to do is you want to let them have a relatively normal dog life, go for walks, do their business, enjoy life, but without generating a ton of heat that they then have to like shed through their brachycephalic airway. So limit playtime, Try to avoid it entirely if it's really hot, and definitely don't take them for walks in the middle of the day. Let them just chill somewhere cool and quiet uh, while the heat sun's up, and then walks at night, early in the morning, late in the evening when it's cooler. Now, uh, because dogs blow off so much heat through their upper airways by panting, uh, adding ice to their water really helps. Uh, you can also give them ice cubes just as little toys, and they'll push them around and play with them. It's super cute, and again, a nice way to cool them down, but that's only a really a small, small effect. What's going to have a greater effect is actually uh, creating a space for them where they can manage their own heat. 
Uh, usually this means giving them access to something like the basement or shade. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about out conditions outside in a moment. But indoors, um, what you can do is you can get a towel, a towel, soak it in water and lay it out uh, somewhere on tile or hardwood floor. And then your dog can lay on it and the towel will basically, the wet towel will function as sweat glands do in a human. It'll make the skin damp and then the water will evaporate and cool down your dog. Uh, for bonus points, you can put it under a fan. So we have airflow, water evaporating, that really helps a body manage temperature. Now, where's my little dog? Claudia, you're finally needed. Where are you? Dee Dee! There you are, my dear. I don't have a dog handy, but I do have this little cat, so let's pretend she's just a small dog. Hello, Claudia. So, let's try to help this little dog cool off. What we can do is we can get a damp cloth and we can wet down her ears, the little radiating mechanisms up here. Now, don't get any water inside the ear because there's a good chance you'll cause an ear infection that way, but just, it's called as an ear pinnae, and we want to wet them down, and as they dry, they'll radiate off a lot of heat. Uh, you can also wet down their armpits and their tummy. You know, dogs have like a hairless area in their tummy. Wet that down as well. Of course, if your dog just lays on a wet towel, they'll get most of the job done. But believe me, some of you will set out a beautiful wet towel on a nice cool towel floor with a fan going over it, and a dog will lay right next to it. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. It's very helpful. You're a good little dog. So yeah, strategically dampening your dog. Very, very good idea. Now, one more tip I'm gonna give you guys, and this is for any dog breed, not just brachiocephalic ones, is to avoid walking them on pavement when it's really hot. We wear shoes, so we don't realize how hot sidewalks and pavement can get, but it's not uncommon for dogs to get burns on their little paw pads by walking on hot pavement. So if you do live somewhere where there's a lot of paved streets, avoid them. Walk your dog on the grass or go for walks in the park where there's shade and trees. Try to avoid walking on uncovered pavement. What you might see if you did take your dog for a walk on an uncovered pavement is you might see little blisters or ulcers on their paw pads. Your dog might limp, but of course if they burn all four feet equally, they won't limp because they have no foot to limp on. And if you see that, take them to the vet. Don't just see if it gets better at home. Uh, there's antibiotic and antiseptic ointments we can put on those paws. We can give them some painkillers. So if you do burn your dog's feet, take them to the vet. Don't just hope it gets better on its own. Or better still, walk them on the grass early in the morning, late in the evening, or go for shady walks in the forest somewhere. Just stay away from hot sidewalks. One more note about our canine friends before we move on is that they, because they use their little paw pads to cool themselves down, they will have a tendency to sometimes dig holes when they're outside to try to get down to colder, moister soil where they can cool down their paws. And they will also actually do this if they have like ulcers on their paws from walking on hot pavement or maybe from running on really a rough surface if they're not used to it. So if you have a dog and you have a yard and you have really hot weather, you may find them digging holes, particularly in the shade and then laying down in them with their front legs in the hole. So, don't get mad at your dog if it does this. It might actually be preventing heat stroke. What you can do if you want to be a really good canine companion is to pour some water into that hole that your dog just dug uh, to make it, the soil in there nice and cool and damp and it will actually increase its efficiency at cooling down your pooch and then you can always fill in the hole later. So don't get upset with your dogs if they dig holes. They're actually just trying to regulate their body temperature. If you don't want them to dig holes, then maybe provide them with alternatives for cooling down such as wet towels, blankets, shade, cold water, ice cubes, all the stuff I just talked about. So now let's move on to other species. Online I'm mostly known as a cat expert, but in my professional life as a veterinarian, I actually deal with a variety of species, including a lot of exotic ones. I work with reptiles and pocket pets. I treat hedgehogs and rabbits and rats and chinchillas and lizards and snakes and even the occasional crocodile. Exotics don't get nearly enough love on my channel. So I wanna take this opportunity to help some of you guys out who have more unusual pets. And rabbits are actually the third most common pet in North America behind cats and dogs. I think this might be true in Europe as well. So there's actually a lot of rabbit owners out there. So if you have rabbits, here's what you can do to help them deal with the hot weather. Uh, first, we need to realize that rabbits get most of their water from their food. Now, most people will feed the rabbits some veggies, and most rabbits need anywhere between a quarter cup to maybe half a cup of green leafies a day to be healthy. 
cucumbers and lettuce are really good water sources for these rabbits. So when the weather's really hot, offering a couple slices of cucumber or a few extra leaves of lettuce will actually help them keep better hydrated. Of course, if you offer too much cucumber or too much lettuce, they get soft stools diarrhea that is very undesirable. Don't do that. Keep an eye on their poops. There should be nice little round dry pellets as always, but do offer them some more cucumber and lettuce in hot days. It'll keep them better hydrated. Of course, if your bunnies live outside, which they sometimes do, I think bunnies make fantastic indoor and apartment pets, but a lot of people do keep bunnies outside. Make sure that your rabbit enclosure is shady. You know, they heat stroke very, very easily. Make sure there's fresh water, shade, uh, a breeze of some sort. Ideally, you can always set up a fan outside as well, or just have the rabbit enclosure somewhere that's well ventilated. And of course, as burrowing animals, rabbits will burrow to get away from the heat. So if you do have an outdoor enclosure with a natural soil floor, you probably know that you need to sink your fences quite deep to keep rabbits from escaping, and you'll definitely find out about this on hot days. So just really make sure your fences are sunk, otherwise you may be getting to know your neighbors really well while trying to recover your escaped bunny. Now, reptiles are a different matter. Most reptiles who are domestic will live in terrariums inside the house, and a big part of reptile health is regulating the temperature that these reptiles experience. And it'll, the appropriate temperature range will vary by species, but probably the most important thing you can do to keep your reptile healthy year-round is to make sure you're always maintaining a steady and appropriate temperature range for them. In the Northern Hemisphere, most of the time, this means heating the enclosure, usually just one end, to get the temperatures up to where the reptiles like it. But during the hot summer months, the reverse may be the case. It may be so hot in your house, it's actually too hot for whatever species you're keeping. So in the summer, it is really, really important to check the temperature in your reptile's enclosure. As a caveat, it's really important anyways. In fact, I recommend everybody have a log book next to their reptile enclosure and they record temperatures in their hot end and cold end at least once every couple of weeks throughout the year. But in the summer, you gotta really pay attention because most of the year you'll just have your heat lamp on, you know, you've set, a, set it up the way you like it, and you, most people just don't think about it. But that might be way too hot in the summer. And I do often see lizards and snakes brought to me in the summer who have heat stroke, who are severely dehydrated because the owners didn't adjust the environment in the terrarium for the environment outside of the terrarium. The apartment gets hot, the house gets hot, and the temperature inside the terrarium gets too hot. So check those thermometers daily inside the terrarium adjust the environment to keep the temperature range appropriate. Now, this might be difficult to do. You may need to turn off your heat lamp, sure, but what if the environmental temperature in your room is still higher than ideal for the bottom of the temperature range for a reptile? There's a couple of things you can do in those cases. Uh, now, some people will put fans over their reptile enclosure, but that can be a little bit problematic because drafts um, aren't really ideal for reptiles, so fans should be a tool of last resort. Uh, what maybe works, sometimes you can get these little clip-on, tiny little fans that maybe just blow air over one end of a terrarium. If you have a large terrarium, you can get away with that. But don't put a big, like, room fan and have it pointing at your reptile enclosure because that'll probably not generate the desired thermal effects. But what you can do is get those cold packs, you just like freezer packs or even just bags full of ice, and put a mesh over the top of your terrarium if you don't already have it there, it's a pretty common feature in many terrariums, put the cold pack or the bag of ice over one end, so maybe covering a quarter of the length of the terrarium, and then as it cools, the cold air from it will sink down and actually cool down that end of the terrarium, creating, again, a temperature gradient, which is what you have to do, and then your reptile can move through that temperature gradient to regulate their internal temperature. So cold packs and ice bags are often the best solution to creating that temperature differential on a really hot day, uh, and I think probably safer than fans, although maybe require a little bit more care. If you have a reptile species that if it comes from a high humidity environment, you can of course keep up, with, get more aggressive with your misting and really mist them quite a bit. Uh, but again, if you have an arid species, you probably shouldn't be making the environment really wet when it's hot because it'll just spike the humidity. You'll probably make things worse, maybe predispose them to fungal skin infections. So don't do that for an arid species. And I mean, I, should, I could make so many videos on this topic, but here's when it becomes really important to know which species your reptile is, whether it's a lizard, a snake, a turtle, and what their natural environment is. Because really, being a successful reptile keeper is all about creating the most natural feeling environment for your little pet. Now let's talk a little bit about outdoor reptiles. And this is gonna be turtles. 
uh, really most people don't keep any other reptile outdoors, but in many parts of the world, people will keep some of the larger tortoise and turtle species outside. So general rules apply here. Water source, shade, uh, hopefully access to a breeze, you know, not, not having like solid walls around the enclosure to prevent any air movement. All those things are really important. And let's face it, turtles are pretty darn good at tolerating hot temperatures. One thing that some outdoor turtle species might do is burrow again to keep cool. So again, you might want to have, depending on the species, you may want to have some sunk fences. Uh, you definitely don't want to fill in any holes your turtle makes during hot weather because those are escape pods to regulate the body temperature. You can actually put a little bit of water in them. Again, dampen down the soil, make them nice and cool for your turtle. Do not fill them in. Uh, make sure they have shade. If your turtle species is a herbivore, eats veggies, again, providing some of those uh, lettuce leaves, some cucumber, just like you would for a rabbit, will really help them maintain hydration. With tortoises, overhydration is much less of a concern than rabbits, so you're probably never going to overhydrate your tortoise with cucumber slices, so just go nuts. And now for the grand finale, the moment you've all been waiting for, cats. <laughs> Mr. Pirate, of course, is here with me. Uh, being a representative of a senior member of the feline species. Mwah. So now we've gotten to the part that probably most of my viewers have been waiting for. How do we help cats deal with heat? Now, cats are little desert species. They're very well adapted to dealing with heat. So generally speaking, they will do quite well in hot weather. But if you have a cat with kidney disease, diabetes, or heart problems, then the you know, their ability to compensate for environmental stresses are decreased and they're going to need a little bit of extra help. Mr. Pirate here, of course, has some mild kidney issues. Um, and like any kidney cat, hydration is so very, very important to keeping him healthy and feeling well. So with cats, it becomes super important to make sure you have ample water sources around your house. I have little water dishes everywhere. Uh, and I make sure to change the water in them daily because cats really do prefer fresh water to drink. Uh, if your cat likes to drink from a leaky tap, make sure that tap is dripping on a hot day. Uh, and of course, little water fountains are really great as well. Again, maybe those don't get changed every day, but you should change them a little bit more often, you know? Dump out the old water, put in some fresh, cool water. Uh, it'll make a big difference to your cat in the summer because we really want to encourage all cats to drink. They are very well adapted to hot weather, but their adaptations involve staying hydrated. Some people recommend putting ice cubes or ice in cat water. Um, I think it's great advice for dogs. I'm not really sure it makes any difference for cats. And I'm always concerned about um, like ice cubes, particularly if they've picked up some weird flavor by being in the fridge too long, might actually flavor the water and cats can be quite sensitive to that. So it may put the cats off of the drinking. So I don't recommend putting ice or ice cubes in cat water, just make sure it's fresh and topped up. As the weather gets hotter, you might notice your cat behavior changing a little bit. You might see them sprawling out languidly, uh, spreading out. And what they're doing when, when they do this is they're trying to radiate heat. Again, cats, like dogs, don't sweat, uh, but they do radiate heat from their paw pads and obviously from their tummy and their underarms. So uh, when they spread out like this, it means they're nice and hot and they're trying to bleed off some heat. Uh, they may sleep more, be less active during daytime hours, maybe prowl around a little bit more at night. Um, but generally speaking, they adapt to heat really, really well. Now, if your cat has a condition where dehydration is life-threatening, such as kidney disease or diabetes, it'll become really important for you to really maintain their subcutaneous fluid regimen. Um, Pretty much all cats with kidney disease should be getting fluids under the skin. Again, I have several videos on my channel about cats and kidney disease, uh, how much subcu fluids to give to your cat, how to give subcu fluids to your cat. So if you have a cat with kidney disease in your life, you must check those videos out. They will save your cat's life or at least add years to it, as well as probably save you thousands of dollars and make your cat much, much happier. And from watching those videos, you will learn that cats with kidney disease get subcutaneous fluids on hot days, weeks, and months, we might want to be a little bit more careful about monitoring their hydration, maybe be a little bit more proactive about giving them their fluids. Um, if your cat has heart disease, do not mess with their fluid. This is a caveat. If your cat has heart disease and kidney disease, that's always a fine balancing act. Uh, talk to your veterinarian before you do anything with their fluids. But if your cat has a healthy heart, you can definitely be a little bit more proactive about fluids. If your cat is diabetic and the blood sugar is not terribly well controlled, 
you might talk to your veterinarian about doing some subcutaneous fluids on hot days because uh, one of the features of diabetes is your blood is a little thicker. So dehydration plus diabetes equals horrible complications on a microscopic level in, in major organ damage. So you really want to keep those diabetic cats well hydrated during hot weather. And subcutaneous fluids may be a tool for you to do that at home with relatively little work and expense. Another health condition that might get your cats into trouble during hot weather is asthma. Uh, cats who are asthmatic, again, may require a few extra puffs of salbutamol because um, you definitely don't want your cat having asthma attacks in really hot weather. Um, and just like dogs, cats can actually pant when they're really hot, but they really shouldn't. You should never really see your cat panting. I mean, if you have like a four month kitten who just had a really vigorous play session and they pant a little bit, that's okay. But if you have an adult cat, particularly an older one, and they're panting, uh, you look at the thermometer. If it's really, really hot, then they might be about to have heat stroke. If it's not really, really hot, then they might be having an asthma attack. And frankly speaking, if they're asthmatic, they might be having an asthma attack and heat stroke. So if you see your cat panting and it's hot outside, that is a big red flag. Now you don't necessarily have to go to the veterinarian right away, but you do want to take steps to cool them down and just kind of keep an eye on things because you know, if they start vomiting and pass out, then you definitely want to take them to the vet. So what can you do to help your cat cool down? Let's say they're an older cat, cat with kidney disease or a cat who's panting. Well, just like with dogs, you can try wetting them down. Wet down their armpits and their tummy. When the cats, and then just lay them out, wet armpits, wet tummy. You can lay down a wet towel like you would for a dog, but let's face it, most cats are not gonna stay away from it. Um, you can definitely put out a fan. So wet your cat down, put a little fan on them. The water evaporating will really, really reduce their core body temperature and really help them manage that overheating. Uh, the other thing you can do to wet your cat down, um, you can just use a wet cloth and squeeze it out, or you can use a little spray bottle. Get a clean spray bottle filled with water. Don't spray your cat from out here. That's like super annoying for cats. That's what we do if you want to like get them off the counter. But if you get the spray bottle really close to your cat's tummy and just gently spritz, 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 it's a really nice way to just wet them down under the underarms and along their belly. I don't know if you guys can see, I'm trying to demonstrate to Mr. Pirate. Come here, little guy. Yeah, so just the whole exposed undercarriage. So underarms, belly, gently spritz it down, make it nice and wet, point a fan at it, and um, you know, maybe your cat will sit there and be cooled, maybe there'll be a contrary creature and run off into a corner somewhere. You know, cats are gonna be cats. You can, you know the old saying about how you can bring a horse to water but you can't make a drink? Same definitely applies to cats and fans. So you can put out a fan, put out water, spritz the cat down, but if the cat wants to be somewhere else, just let him go, don't fight him, because honestly, you're gonna make him overheat by trying to wrestle him more than any good you're gonna do by dampening their tummy. But you know, most older cats tend to be a little more chill, so they tend to be more receptive to us helping them. So let's just quickly review. Lots of water, soak their tummy, airflow, fans, um, and then subcutaneous fluids, if they're already getting them, you might wanna give them, be a little bit more proactive about your schedule. Of course, if you have an outdoor cat in your life, uh, same thing applies as for other species. Make sure there's always a water dish outside where the cat can reach it. Make sure there's some shady bits around your house where the cat can hide and preferably put the water dish there. And just generally speaking, um, try not to lock them anywhere where they can't escape from the heat, such as like a hot room, um, solarium, or you know, a yard that has no easy exits out of it. There have definitely been incidents of cats locked on balconies or rooftops or patios uh, who end up getting heat stroke and end up needing to be taken to the veterinary emergency hospital. So uh, please try to avoid doing that. That's Pirate Spot. He likes to sit there and kind of observe the world through the windows. We call it the observatorium because he observes. So now you guys are all experts on thermal management of pets. Uh, regardless of what species you have in your life, you can apply some or all of the tips I talked about in this video to make your little animal friends' lives better in the hot weather. If you have a tip or trick you wanna share that I haven't mentioned yet, please feel free to leave a comment in the comments below. We can all learn from each other. And please just be a little bit mindful of your pets and of yourself as the weather gets really, really hot. I hope you found that video helpful. Have a nice day and just remember to have fun with your pets.